Good evening. Do you remember the eclipse of the moon last August? It was quite well seen from here, and this rather lovely photo was taken by Michael Maunda, and there the eclipse is very nearly total. I wasn't here at the time. I was in California, actually on Mount Wilson, site of the great 100-inch telescope, which was, for so long, the largest and most powerful telescope in the world. Unfortunately, I only had my pocket hand camera with me, and the wretched thing would flash whether I liked it or not, and I felt so totally idiotic trying to photograph a lunar eclipse with the aid of flash, and I hope nobody saw me. Needless to say, it didn't work. But a friend of mine who was with me did have a camera which didn't flash, and he took this picture, and there down to the right is the dome with a hundred inch, and there is the eclipsed moon. Rather a striking picture, I think. If you missed the eclipse, don't worry, there's going to be another one next February. In these programs, I've often pointed out that amateurs can do really valuable work. Well, we have one very good case of that just recently. One of our best amateur astronomical photographers is Brian Manning. And recently, he was hunting for asteroids, or minor planets, which, as I'm sure you know, are small worlds, most of which keep very firmly to that part of the solar system between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Over 4,000 are now known, they look like stars, but of course they do move from one night to another, and new ones are always being discovered. Well, Brian Manning seems to have discovered two new asteroids. Here is one of his pictures. This, of course, is a negative, so the stars are black against the background. And there to the lower right is an asteroid, indicated there by the red markers, and I do hasten to add that the red markers were put on afterwards. Now, here's the same area at a different period, and as you can see, the asteroid has moved, and that betrays its nature. So as far as we can tell, this and one more are genuine new discoveries, so full marks to Brian Manning. At the moment, the planet Venus is nicely visible, low down in the southwest after sunset. It is low down because, unfortunately, it's well to the south of the celestial equator, but it's so bright you can't possibly mistake it. It far outshines any other star or planet. Actually, on November the 15th, Venus and Saturn will be close together, and that's worth looking at telescopically, although, of course, they do set very soon after the sun and before the sky has got properly dark. Meanwhile, the Galileo probe is on its way to Jupiter, safely launched from Cape Canaveral and now on its course. It won't go straight to Jupiter, though. It's going in a very complicated way. It will begin by swinging in toward Venus, swing round Venus, round the sun, past the Earth, back round the sun, around the sun again, past the Earth, and finally start on its long outward trek to Jupiter, and it should get there in December 1995. Rather like going from Brighton to Bognor by way of Grimsby, I'm afraid, but it will get there, and it's going to be a very important probe indeed. It's made up of two parts. One part is an orbiter, and that'll go round and round Jupiter, monitoring the changing surface, and also carrying out close-range surveys of the four big satellites. The other part is an entry probe. Jupiter's surface is made up of gas, and there are cloud glares there, clouds of various compositions. The entry probe will simply plunge down into the clouds. It won't last for long, obviously. It will soon be destroyed. But before it goes, it will send back fascinating information. So we hope that Galileo will succeed, and we'll tell you more about it in 1995. Meanwhile, you can see Jupiter now in the rather north of east after sunset, in the constellation Gemini, and again, so bright you can't possibly misidentify it, it's outshone only by Venus. And Jupiter at the moment is particularly interesting. It has a gaseous surface, and on that you can normally see cloud belts. And usually there are two major belts, one to either side of Jupiter's equator. Well, when Jupiter came around from conjunction with the Sun last uh, a few months ago, I looked at it with my telescope, and I saw something very strange. The south equatorial belt, which is normally so prominent, had virtually disappeared. I'm sure I wasn't the first to notice that, but I think I probably was one of the first. And here's a drawing I made quite recently with my 15-inch reflector. It's got south at the top, and there, below the centre, you can see the main North Equatorial Belt, and you can also see the Great Red Spot, which hasn't been very much on view lately, but has now come back into visibility. And normally, just north of that, that's to say, below in this picture, you should see the very pronounced South Equatorial Belt, and you don't. Well, I've been looking at Jupiter now for the last 50 years. I've never seen it looking quite like that before, so Jupiter is very much on my observing list for the next few months. Meanwhile, for this evening, 
I want to leave the solar system and look further afield, and I want to say something about one of the most famous of all the winter constellations, Taurus the Bull. And um, like so many constellations, it has a mythological legend. It is said to be the bull into which Jupiter, the king of the gods, changed himself when he wanted to carry off a beautiful lady named Europa. And um, what happened after that we won't go into because um, it doesn't do to inquire too closely into the morals of the ancient Olympians. Anyway, Taurus is there, so let's find it, beginning with Orion, which is now in the southeast after dark. Orion has its two main stars, the orange-red Betelgeuse, and the brilliant white Rigel. And Rigel is a true cosmic searchlight, something like 60,000 times more luminous than our sun. And in the central Orion's pattern, we have the three stars of the hunter's belt. Downwards, they point to Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Upwards, they show the way to Aldebaran, the orange star, which is the eye of the bull, and the leading star of Taurus. In colour, Aldebaran is very much the same as Betelgeuse. It's not really the same kind of star. It's nothing like so luminous and nothing like so far away. And generally speaking, it's rather fainter. Aldebaran doesn't change much, but Betelgeuse does. Betelgeuse is a genuine variable star. It swells and shrinks, changing magnitude as it does so. Sometimes it's nearly as bright as Rigel, sometimes not much brighter than Aldebaran. And at the moment, Aldebaran is rather the fainter of the two. But there it is. Now look at Aldebaran, and over to the right-hand side, you will see a little V formation of stars. And they make up the open star cluster, which we call the Hyades. Now the Hyades are in fact uh, a genuine cluster, and here's a rather lovely picture of them, taken by Ron Arbor. Aldebaran there, slightly below the centre of the picture, and you can see the V of the Hyades extending off toward the right. Frankly, it's not much point in looking at the Hyades through a telescope. The cluster covers quite a wide area, and you won't get all the stars in the same field at once. It's far better to use low-powered binoculars, and if you do that, you will see the Hyades really well. Unfortunately, they're rather overpowered by the bright orange light of Aldebaran, and Aldebaran is not really a member of the cluster at all. It simply happens to lie in much the same direction as seen from the Earth, so we're dealing with nothing more than a line of sight effect. Let me show you what I mean. Aldebaran is over 60 light years away. The Hyades are about twice that distance, and that's why they're so overpowered. And uh, in astronomy, things are not always what they seem. But in spite of that, there's plenty to see in the Hyades, and one interesting pair of stars there is known as Theta Tauri, quite close to Aldebaran. See it quite clearly with the naked eye, and if you've got really keen eyes, you may be able to see that Theta Tauri is made up of two. And that's well shown on this second Ron Arbor picture. There again is Aldebaran, below the centre, and rather above Aldebaran, to the right, you'll see two fainter stars, and they make up Theta Tauri. Now, use binoculars, and you will see they're of different colours. The brighter star of the Theta pair is white, and the fainter one is orange, and they make rather a nice colour contrast, although I'm afraid you won't see those colours with the naked eye, because the two stars are not bright enough. They are not genuine neighbours, the orange star is 15 light years further away from us than the bright one, but no doubt they were produced in the same way at about the same time. Because open clusters are very common in the universe, in our galaxy, and we believe that the stars in any particular open cluster are formed from the same mass of dust and gas. So all the Hyades were formed in that way, but clearly that does not extend to Aldebaran, which, as we've seen, is not a genuine Hyade at all. Well, the Hyades are worth looking at, but I think they pale in comparison with the second of famous Taurus star clusters, the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters. And to find those, simply carry on the line from Orion's belt through Aldebaran, curve it slightly, and then you will come to the Pleiades. And at first sight, the Pleiades cluster looks like a patch of mist. And you know, um, when it comes into view in evenings in autumn, I always feel that's the start of winter, and frost, uh, frost and fogs lie close ahead. But look more closely at the Pleiades, and you will find it's not mist at all, the cluster is made up of stars. Not all the stars you can see in this picture are genuine members of the cluster. There are some in the background, but certainly the cluster is quite populous. And it's interesting to discover how many separate stars in the cluster you can see with the naked eye. Well, a long time ago, must have been about 1959, I think, I decided to try and find out. The cluster is always known as the Seven Sisters, but keen-sighted people can certainly see more than that. So I asked viewers of the sky at night 
to look at the Pleiades on a clear, dark night, and then write in and tell me how many individual stars they could see. Well, the average number did indeed work out at seven, but some people could see more. And if you're seeing nine or ten, you're doing pretty well. Twelve is very good indeed, and I believe that the record is held by the last century German astronomer, Eduard Heiss, who's supposed to have seen nineteen. But certainly, seven is the average number, and the main stars have been given individual names. The brightest member is called Alcyone, that's magnitude three, and the other names are there. Look, by the way, at Pleione over to the left-hand side, closer to the rather brighter Atlas, and Pleione is what's called a shell star. Now and then, it gives off shells of material, and it varies in brightness, so it's highly unstable. But certainly, the Pleiades make up a lovely group, and again, binoculars give the best view of them. As before, uh, there's always a mythological legend, and there is a legend attached to the Pleiades. It's said that the Pleiades were seven beautiful maidens who one day went for a harmless stroll in a wood. They were seen by the great hunter Oran, and Oran pursued them with intentions which were, obviously, quite dishonorable. Well, Jupiter, the king of the gods, saw what was happening, and to save the girls from a fate worse than death, he changed them into stars and placed them in the sky, which is where we see them today. Now let's start with something different. Back in Taurus, we have Aldebaran, we have the Pleiades and the Hyades. Let's now identify the third magnitude star, Zeta Tauri. Nothing very remarkable about it. It's quite luminous, about a thousand sun power. Like Pleione, it's a shell star, but in itself it's unremarkable. But very close to it is a very strange thing called the Crab Nebula, which is a patch of gas in the sky. You can't see it with the naked eye, it's too faint for that. You need a telescope. In fact, if you've got powerful binoculars, you can see it as a faint, misty patch. I've got a pair of 20 by 70 binoculars. That's to say, a magnification of 20, with each object glass 70 millimeters across. And with that, if I put Zeta Tauri in the field, I can just see the patch of the Crab Nebula. And lower power binoculars may do, but certainly to see it clearly, you do need a telescope. And if you want to see it in all its glory, well, you can't really see it like that. You've got to photograph it with a large telescope, and there is a picture of the crab showing an immensely complex structure. I may say that it's 6,000 light years away, which is quite some distance. But why is it called the crab? Well, the name was due to the third Earl of Ross. In the middle of the last century, Lord Ross built a huge telescope, a 72-inch reflector, set it up at Burr Castle, and made very important studies of the sky, and there is his drawing of the crab. Bear in mind, of course, this was made long before photography came along in that respect. And uh, Lord Ross's nickname has stuck, even though the crab was known officially as M1, or Messier 1. Uh, it was actually discovered in the 1730s by a British amateur named John Beavis, catalogued by Charles Messier in 1781, and given number one in his catalogue. So officially it is M1. And we know what it is. It's the wreck of an exploding star, or supernova. Way back in the year 1054, Chinese and Korean astronomers observed a bright star in a part of the sky where no star had been seen before. It became so brilliant, it was actually visible with the naked eye in broad daylight, and it lasted for several months before fading away and becoming invisible with the naked eye, when of course it was lost. It's not very well documented, I'm afraid. Uh, it doesn't seem to have been recorded in Europe. It was recorded, we think, by some of the American Indians, and this old rock drawing may show the supernova, but I wouldn't be at all sure. Anyway, it was certainly a brilliant new star, and then a patch of gas was discovered in that position. And here's a drawing of that gas patch, the Crab Nebula, made by Admiral Smythe in the last century. But what exactly is it? Now, a supernova of this kind happens when a very massive star literally runs out of fuel and collapses. There's an implosion, followed by a vast explosion, and the star blows most of its material away into space, leaving a small, super-dense remnant and a patch of expanding gas. And that is the modern Crab Nebula, and we can actually trace its changes. Photographs, taken over intervals of years, do show obvious alterations in form. And right in the heart of the Crab Nebula is the powerhouse, the pulsar, the remnant of the old star. And this is made up of neutrons. It's small, only a few miles across. It is amazingly dense. You could take a thousand million tons of neutron star material and pack it very comfortably into a wine glass. As it spins round 30 times a second, it sends out pulsed radio waves, 
And that's how we first identified it, though it has now been seen optically. There were plenty of pulsars known, but the crab was the first to be identified with a very faint flashing object. Well, you may ask, why is the crab so important to astronomers? The answer is, it sends out radiations in virtually all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Radio waves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, uh, X-rays, gamma rays, you name it, the crab does it. And therefore it is immensely informative. And uh, somebody once said, there are two kinds of astronomy, the astronomy of the crab nebula and the astronomy of everything else. And by sheer bad luck, there hasn't been another supernova outburst in our galaxy since the invention of the telescope way back in 1609, 1610. The two previous supernovae were those of 1572 and 1604. Though, of course, in 1987, we had the next best thing, a supernova in the large cloud of Magellan, and we've talked about that very often in these sky at night programs. Whether that's going to produce a pulsar is something we don't yet know. It may do, it may not, we've got to wait and see. So, the Crab Nebula is of great importance. Let's now come back to Taurus and look at another interesting star. This one's called Lambda Tauri. Not very striking. Normally, it's about magnitude 3.3. You can find it by using the, the, the Hyades as a kind of arrowhead, and the arrow points straight to Lambda. But Lambda is an eclipsing binary, so it appears to vary in magnitude. Uh, usually, magnitude 3.3, .3, that's about the same brightness as the faintest of the seven stars in the plow pattern of the Great Bear. But every four days, Lambda Tauri gives a long, slow wink and fades down almost to magnitude 4. And this is because it's made up not of one star, but two. These two components are going round each other in a period of four days, and when the faint star goes in front of the bright star, the total magnitude drops, and you can see that from the light curve. There's a much fainter minimum when the bright star goes in front of the fainter, but you won't notice that with the naked eye. These eclipsing binders are not uncommon, but Lambda Tauri is one of the best examples of them. And if you want to see it performing, you can do so in the near future. A minimum is due on November the 14th at 20.06, that's six minutes past 8 p.m., and another at 1855 on the 18th. And the classic way of studying a variable star is to compare it with other stars that don't vary, and there are two good comparisons near Lambda. One is Gamma Tauri, and the end of the V in the Hyades, that's magnitude 3.6, and the other, rather fainter, New Tauri, below Lambda, magnitude 3.9. So look at Lambda Tauri for a little while to either side the minimum, and you'll see it, and you'll see it behaving. And I just wonder what Lambda Tauri would look like from close range. And this drawing by Paul Doherty shows what you might see. Two hot white suns going around each other, and um, any large approaching comet might well have multiple tails because it will be influenced by two suns instead of one. I wonder if anyone actually will see that. Finally, let me show you a star which Taurus has stolen. It's called Almath, and it's bright above the second magnitude. It used to belong to the constellation of Auriga, whose brightest star is a brilliant yellow capella, almost overhead in winter evenings. But for some reason, Alnath has now been taken away from Auriga and given to Taurus. So it used to be called Gamma Aurigae, it's now called Beta Tauri. So the charioteer has lost one star, and Taurus has gained it. But even without Alnath, there's plenty of interest in Taurus. So um, do have a look at the bull in the sky. And um, if the sky is clear now, why not go outside and find it for yourself? Good night.